This video is brought to you by Women in Parenthesis, a project exploring the work of Iris Murdoch, Philippa Foote, Elizabeth Anscombe and Mary Midgley. To find out more about us and access worksheets and podcasts about these four amazing philosophers, visit us at womeninparenthesis.co.uk. Mary Midgley on Metaethics and Emotivism. Mary Midgley was a philosopher who lived from 1919 until 2018. She was a champion of animal ethics and the environment, and her work often dealt with practical issues like this in applied ethics. But in order to deal with urgent practical problems, she also dug deeper into the underpinnings of ethics. She thought that moral philosophy had taken a number of wrong turns in the 20th century. And this included the ways that we talk about fact and value and about thinking and feeling. If Midgley is right in what she said about these, when you put them together, it poses a serious threat to many theories in metaethics and particularly to emotivism. So let's have a bit of background on the stuff that Midgley was tackling. One of the figures who had a massive effect on the development of philosophical ethics was G.E. Moore, who lived from 1873 until 1958. He wrote the Principia Ethica in 1910. Now, in many ways, Midgley was an admirer of Moore, but she thought that some of his ideas had kicked off a wrong turn in philosophy. Now, Moore talked about a lot of things in the Principia Ethica, but the one that matters for us here is what he said about the meaning of the word good. And Moore thought very confidently that almost all moral theories before him had made a huge basic error. Kantian deontology, utilitarianism and so on tell us which things are good, for example, a good will or maximising happiness, but, he said, they don't tell us anything about what good actually means, even though they pretend to do that. Now, this isn't an immediately obvious idea to grasp, so let's look at it a bit more closely. We can ask a lot of questions that begin, what is? For example, what is the weather forecast? What is the news? What is your Twitter handle? What is a fronted adverbial? Or what is even the point in learning about fronted adverbials anyway? Now, some of these questions might be answered in a couple of different ways. So if we ask, what is the weather forecast? We would usually mean to ask what the weather is supposed to be doing in the next couple of days. Will it be sunny? Will it snow? Can I have that barbecue? But the question might mean something entirely different. So maybe, when I ask what is the weather forecast, I've had a bizarre memory lapse and I don't remember what a weather forecast actually is. In this case, the question would be answered by explaining about meteorologists, maps, funny little symbols and so on. So let's get back to the question, what is good? Well, Moore thought that most moral philosophers had answered it in the first way, just as we might answer the question, what is the weather forecast by saying that we're in for blizzards or a heat wave, they answered the question, what is good by talking about pleasure, the good will or whatever. The problem is, said Moore, that all of these people are confusing this answer with the answer to the question of what the word good actually means. Now, Moore thought that no matter how much detail we went into when talking about, say, maximising pleasure, it wouldn't get us any closer to defining the concept of goodness. In fact, he thought that we couldn't define it with reference to any of the normal properties that we observe around us in the world. Good, he said, can't be defined in terms of natural properties, for example, pleasure. And 
In this sense, he thought there's an unbridgeable gap between facts and values. Just by looking at the facts of things, like how much pleasure was generated by a particular action, we couldn't learn anything about the nature of goodness. Value is a totally different sort of thing. So that's more. The important thing to remember here is the importance of the gap between facts and values. And the idea that we make a mistake when we think that we could get, a get from a statement about facts or how things are to values or how they ought to be. This mistake is known as the naturalistic fallacy. Now let's look at another important bit of background, the Vienna Circle. Now, although it sounds like a kind of biscuit, the Vienna Circle was actually a group of philosophers, scientists, logicians and mathematicians who regularly met at the University of Vienna in the 1920s and 1930s. They were interested in scientific method and how we can learn meaningful things about the world around us. So what things are meaningful things? Well, one of their important views was that only statements that can be tested by observation or logical proof have meaning. If you state something, grass is green, for example, we need to think about how we would test that statement. In this case, we would do it by carefully examining different species of grass. We can do that so your statement has meaning. Take another type of statement say triangles have three sides. In this case, we couldn't look at all of the existing triangles to decide if the statement was true. Instead, the best thing to do is to think about the definition of a triangle. So a triangle is by definition a three-sided shape. So it can be shown logically that triangles have three sides. Now, statements don't need to be true to be meaningful. So for example, all pigs can fly is a meaningful statement because it can be tested scientifically. But the scientists carrying out this unwise set of experiments wouldn't take very long to conclude that the statement is false. So statements which can't be tested by science or logic, the Vienna Circle said, lack truth value. That doesn't mean that they're false, it means that they're the sort of thing that can't be either true or false. And this category includes a range of things. For example, statements about God, statements about aesthetics, so the value of artwork, for example, statements about ethics, and some statements about psychology. So if moral statements, for example, lying is wrong, aren't the sort of thing that can be true or false. What even are they? What are we doing when we use moral language? And this is where A.J. Eyre comes in. Eyre lived from 1910 until 1918 and he had quite the life. He was educated at Oxford and Eton, he was an agent for MI6 in the Second World War, and he was married four times to three different women, including Nigella Lawson's mum. He wrote a famous book called Language, Truth and Logic in 1936, when he was only in his 20s. Now in this, he agreed with Moore that moral values are a very different thing from facts. And he also agreed with the Vienna Circle that moral statements couldn't be true or false. In ethics, this, this view is known as non-cognitivism. But non-cognitivism is a view about what moral statements are not. So this still leaves us a question about what they actually are. And Eyre attempted to answer this question. So he argued that they were expressions of emotion, a position called emotivism. And this sometimes gets called the boo-hurrah theory, because saying lying is wrong is taken to be equivalent to pointing at people lying and shouting boo. 
Now, it's a sad thing for philosophical ethics that there was no such thing as an emoji in Ayer's day, because that would have made his theory so much easier to explain. When we use the most common emojis, like the smiley face or that little angry one, we aren't trying to communicate a fact. Instead, we're expressing how we feel about something. And Eyre thought that this was what we were basically doing when we made moral statements. So the emotivist might say that the statement lying is wrong is a bit like writing the word lying and then putting an angry face emoji after it. So let's see what Mary Midgley had to say about all of this. So first, let's look at her views on the naturalistic fallacy. So remember that this is the idea that there's an unbridgeable gap between facts and values and that moral theories make an error when they say that we can learn stuff about values by looking at facts. Now, Midgley rejected the idea that there is a clear, straightforward separation between fact and value. That's not to say that there's no difference at all, but she thinks that they're much more muddled together than we might initially think. So how did she do this? Well, she said that facts are never raw data. Whenever we learn something new about the world, we do so with a pre-existing framework that helps it to make sense. We have pictures, stories, metaphors and so on in our heads that allow us to make sense of the stuff that we learn. It fits into the fabric of what we already know, a kind of a narrative or story about the world. Now, these frameworks, she thinks, are strongly influenced by the values of individuals and by the society that they live in. And this isn't necessarily a problem because that's just how we work as human beings. It's something that we need if anything's going to make sense at all. But if we aren't aware that we're doing it, we can start to run into confusion. And Midgley said that we continually use fact and value together, whether we're making moral choices or learning new things. Fact and value simply aren't as separate as we might suppose. So that's Midgley's view about more and facts and values. But she also had important things to say about the relationship between thinking and feeling. And this is important for air and emotivism. So remember that air thought that moral statements were expressions of feeling and not the kinds of statements of fact that could be tested by science or logic. So in this sense, he thought that morality was wholly a matter of feeling rather than thinking. But Midgley thought that ethics shouldn't be one or the other. It shouldn't be just a matter of feeling or just a matter of thinking. It had to be both. And this is because she thought that thinking and feeling are very closely interrelated in every single thing that we do. So when we form a moral judgment, this often involves feeling a certain way. But sometimes that might change when we think about the situation carefully. So maybe you can recall the situation in your own life when you were quick to morally condemn someone. And then you just took a step back and thought about their situation. Maybe you thought about the difficulties that they were facing or how they must have felt or situations in their upbringing that brought them to that point. You might then have experienced your own feelings changing and your moral judgment changing too. Now here, thinking and feeling are working together in forming a moral view. And it isn't always easy to pick out which are the thinking bits and which are the feeling bits because they're always going step in step together. So what does this mean for emotivism? Well, Midgley has challenged two strict separations that underpin emotivism. The separation between thinking and feeling and the separation between facts and values. Now, if thinking and feeling always work together, then moral statements can't just be an expression of emotion. They must involve thoughts too. 
And some of these thoughts might be the kinds of things that can be tested by logical or scientific inquiry. If fact and value always work together, then we can't say that statements of fact can be true or false, but statements of value, like moral statements, can't. Most statements, whether they're moral statements or others, are going to involve a mix of fact and value. So here are some questions to consider. How was A.J. Ayer's emotivism influenced by Moore's naturalistic fallacy and by the logical positivism of the Vienna Circle? How important do you think emotion is in morality or should we try to take emotion out of it as far as possible? Do you agree with Ayer that moral statements are just the expression of emotions? Think about a choice that you've had to make in your own life. How did thinking and feeling work together in coming to a decision? Do you agree with Midgley that the separation between fact and value is not as clear as we might think? So that's all for now. You can learn more about Mary Midgley at inparenthesis.co.uk and at notesfromabiscuittin.com. Goodbye.